we have many denominations throughout the world of Christendom and Christianity. And one of the greatest uh, controversies is salvation by grace. People just don't want to lay their works down and their pride down. You've got Armenian culture on one side that believes in salvation by works, basically. And you've got the other group is Calvinism. And sometimes even Calvinists uh, have such an idea of, of salvation is that when you're saved, uh, it, it, the regeneration takes place, and some of them to the point of almost sinless perfection like the Armenian culture. Somewhere in the middle of all of that is the truth. And Paul, in his Galatian letter, tries to bring that out so plainly. Now I have taught every book in the New Testament from Greek, word for word, from, Genesis, or from uh, Matthew through Revelation. But we're going back and we're just doing Bible readings. We're commenting on it a little bit because sometimes it's too slow to go through it in definite detail. And sometimes when you go through it so slowly, you miss some of the big points. The gravity of it, the, the excitement of it. And so that's what I'm doing here. I'm going to read my little introduction to the book of Galatians. It was written somewhere around between 57 and 50, well, 56 to 57 A.D., about 17 years after Paul's conversion. And uh, it was written after the Jerusalem Conference. Now, the Jerusalem Conference, if you remember, was a conference where they tried to, the Judaizing Christians, a lot of them were Jews, Hebrews that came from Judaism. And they wanted to bring Judaism into the church. Judaism, Judaism was supposed to lead you up to the church. Lead you up to salvation by grace and by God. And here they wanted to keep all of these laws again. And if they didn't keep these laws, if they weren't circumcised, etc., 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 you couldn't be saved. It was grace plus works. And that's the real problem. The churches of Galatia were several in number, basically in southern Turkey today. Pisidia, Lyconia, Pergamion, these were churches in the areas where Paul was trying to reach them. The Judaizers had made such a controversy trying to take over the churches. The reason why the Jews didn't accept Jesus Christ in the beginning is that they would take their religion away from them and their power and their authority away from them. God deals with you between you, your spirit, and his spirit. Between you and his son and between you and the Father. Salvation is by grace, and yet it is not frivolous. It is a beautiful thing. Don't ever forget, these letters, Ephesians and Galatians, were written to assure you that God did the work, and you are the recipient of the grace of God. Paul said in, in the Ephesian letter, the circular letter called the Ephesian letter, he said, For in grace ye are having been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Now here in the Galatians, he just na nails every little thing down. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. He just names everything out. Now let's listen to Paul's words by the inspiration of God telling us how God is the initiator of salvation, God is the procurer of salvation, and God is the one that calls you, and God is the one that keeps you. Paul, an apostle, 
not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ. And God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace, grace, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. You don't do anything for your sins. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. That he might deliver us out of the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am amazed that you are so quickly removed and deserting him who called you by grace, by the grace of Christ, for a different and to a different gospel. Heteros. That's a different kind of gospel. Which is really not another, only that there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Jesus Christ. But even though we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Let him go to hell. And we have said before, so I say and say again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to which you have received, let him be accursed. Two times he says this. Let him be damned. For I am now seeking the favor <clears throat> of men, or of God, or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. I would not be a slave of Jesus Christ. Salvation is by grace, but once you surrender your life to Him, then we're His. We're His. We sin. We don't serve Him like we ought to. But He is ours and we are His. And we are encouraged by the Spirit of God to follow in His footsteps. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. No man would figure out the gospel that God has given to man. It's all of God and nothing of you. For I neither received it from man, nor I was taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. If you have heard of my former matter of life in Judaism, and how that I used to per persecute the church and, and God beyond measure, and tried to destroy the church. <clears throat> and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions, the Mishnah and the Talmud. And when he had set me aside, apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I do not immediately consult with, with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later I went up to Jerusalem and became acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him fifteen days. Remember an apostle was a was a problem. If you were a real apostle, you had to be know about the ministry of Jesus Christ. You had to spend time at Jesus' feet to be an apostle. And they said Paul, the apostle, wasn't ever with Jesus, but Jesus took him three years to Arabia and taught him one on one. Yes, he was. He met the requirements of being an apostle. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And we'll get to the book of James one of these days too. It, it seems like a different story almost. Mm -hmm. Now in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the region of Syria and of Cilicia. And I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But only that they kept hearing that 
He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. Then after an interval of about 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus also along also. And I was, and it was because of reverie, revelation that I went up and submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Works, works, works. But it was because of the false brethren who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage again. But we do not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. But from those who were of high reputation, uh, what they were makes no difference to me. God <coughs> shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. The big shocks. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcision, just as Peter also to the circumcised, for he who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcision effectively worked for me also among the Gentiles, the heathens. And recognized the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me Barnabas, the right hand of fellowship, that we might go to the Gentiles and, and they to the circumcised. Now here's where Bollinger goes off. We got two Gospels. We got one Gospel. They're not two Gospels. There's one Gospel. We're not, we don't have Peter's Gospel and Paul's Gospel. We have one Gospel. But these, the Jews were always arrogant in their high and lofty ideals that they were the chosen of God. Now we are the chosen of God. They only ask us to remember the poor, the very thing I also eager to do. But when Cephas came in Antioch, I, I opposed him face to face because he stood condemned. Peter, the Catholicism's pillar of their church, supposedly. Peter. Paul had to reprimand Peter. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, uh, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloft in fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined to him in hypocrisy. This is church members now. With the result that even Barnabas was carried away by this hypocrisy. And when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in presence of all, If you, being a Jew, like, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? We are Jews by nature. And not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we believed in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. The law became an enemy of Christ. Since by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, but if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild 
what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, that I might live to God. And I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live is in the flesh, I live by faith. In the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Now, Apostle Paul was a pretty somewhat righteous man, wasn't he? But he keeps saying, it's not me. It's Christ that lives in me. Mm -hmm. What I do for the Lord, I do for the Lord because he lives in me. What you do for the Lord, you do for the Lord because he lives in you. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through faith, through the law, then Christ died needlessly. No one ever was justified before God through works. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly betrayed, uh, portrayed and crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by, by the works of the law or, or the hearing of the faith? Did you receive the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, because you were good? and you follow the works of the law, or did you do it by faith? For in grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, a lot of what works, lest any man should bold. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, and you now being perfected in the, by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who then provides you with the Spirit and works and miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned unto him for righteousness and that man was not a righteous man. In men's eyes, he went down and sold his wife to, to Pharaoh. You tell Pharaoh that, that Abraham was righteous. You go down to Abimelech and, and that he sold his wife to him again and you go tell Abimelech that, that uh, Abraham lived in truth and righteousness. But God said that he was a man of faith, that he was a father of the faithful, because they believed God. Therefore be sure that it is those who are of the faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. He preached the gospel unto Noah also in, in, in Genesis, the ninth chapter, verses 24 and 25, etc. All the nations shall be blessed in you. So then those who are of the faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse which is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God, it is evident. For the righteous, the righteous man shall live by faith. Habakkuk. The just man shall live by faith. The righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith, on the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come even to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The intent of the law. What was the law too? What was the law? You know what the law told me? It told me I was a sinner. I needed something else. Rather than I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sits aside or adds our conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, 
to seats as to many, but rather to one. And to your seed, that, that is Christ. What I'm saying is that the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based upon promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Promise is grace. Why the law, then? It was added because of the transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator, until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. Genesis 3.15 And now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if the law had been given and was able to impart life, then righteousness would have indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up all men under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law being shut up, jailed, incarcerated, up to the faith which was later to be revealed. The law was a prison cell. It was a prison cell, a jail cell, oh. until Christ came and faith came. Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith, but that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. You went to kindergarten in the law, Paul said. You were in kindergarten. Now we are in Christ Jesus by faith. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized, dipped unto Christ, have been clothed yourselves with Christ, and therefore it is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Girls, amen. All right? And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to a promise, to grace. For by grace are you saved. Now I say, as long as the heir <coughs> is a child, he does not differ uh, at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under a guardian's managers to set a date by the father. So also, while we were children, we were held in bondage under the element of elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might reveal and redeem to those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption, wheothesia, as wheels, as sons, heirs. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son in our hearts, crying, Daddy, Daddy. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. However, at that time, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are no gods. They were slaves to false gods, to idols, like Catholicism today. Catholicism is idolatry. Islam is idolatry. But now you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how that is you turn your back again, to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you were desired to be enslaved all over again. You observe days and months and seasons or years. I fear that you or perhaps I have labored in vain over you. I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong, but you know 
that it is that it was because of the, the bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. He was sick. And that which is a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise nor loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you have? For I bear you witness that if possible you had have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. I have therefore become your enemy by telling you the truth. They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out in order that you may seek them. But it is good always to eagerly sought in a commendable manner, and not only when I am present with you. My children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. You haven't been born yet. I'm still in labor, he says. I'm still in labor. I'm still trying to bring forth you as children of God. A woman wouldn't like that. Be held in labor because of the child. But I wish you to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bond, bond woman and the other by the free woman. But the son of the bond woman was born according to the flesh. Ishmael and the son of the free woman to the promise. That's Isaac, Yitzhak. This is an allegory. This is a parable, he says, speaking for those women of two covenants. Proceeding from the Mount Sinai and bearing children who are to be slaves, she is Hagar. Do you want to be Hagar's child or do you want to be the Lord Jesus Christ? Now this Hagar in Mount Sinai in Arabia corresponds to the present Jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, she is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for more are the children of the desolate than the, than the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But at the time he was born, according to the flesh, persecuted he who was born according to the Spirit. So it's now also. Ishmael persecuted Isaac. Jacob was persecuted by Esau. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but children of the free woman. Do you want to become Hagar's children, or do you want to become Sarah's children? It was the freedom that Christ set us free, therefore keep standing firm. Do not be subject to the yoke of slavery again. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. I testify again, every man who receives circumcision that is under obligation to keep the whole law, you have been severed from, cut off from Christ. You are now seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. For we through the spirit of faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? 
This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you that the Lord, that you will adopt no other view, but those who are disturbing you shall bear this judgment, whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. Would that those who are troubling you would be mutilate themselves. Paul calls the Jews who circumcise you mutilators. Mutilators were the pagans who cut themselves. And he, had, and he tells them that the Jews are now pagan mutilators because they have left Christ. The mutilators. For you are called to freedom, brethren. Not only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For well, the whole law is fulfilled in one word, the statement, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the, the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh for these are the opposition one to another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are fed and led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, witchcraft, enemies, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, and factions, envying and drunkenness and carousing, and things like these of which I forewarned you, just as I also have forewarned you, that those who practice these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. Now to those who belong to Christ Jesus, who have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another, Brethren, even if a man is caught in any trespass, you are spiritual. Restore such a one in spirit and gentleness, each one looking toward yourselves. You too could be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, thus fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one of you examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. In other words, you can say, thank you, Lord, help me through this. But don't tell people, I'm so great. For each one shall bear his own load, and let the one who is taught the word, share all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived by God. God is not mocked, for whatsoever man sows, that same thing shall he also reap. The law of sowing and reaping. For those who sow to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not lose heart in doing well and doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good 
to all men, especially those who are of the household of the faith. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Paul evidently was very, he had been blinded almost by the things that happened to him, the stonings, etc., the beatings. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. He's condemning Peter and James. For those who are circumcision do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But may it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ to which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new, a new tradition, a new creation. Those who will walk by this rule of peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause trouble for me. For I bear in my own my body the brand marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, be with your spirit, brethren, amen. All I can say is amen to this message. This message is inspired of God. And it is a message for you and for me, for all those who are in Christ and all those who are outside of Christ. There's only one way you're going to get to heaven. It's not by what you've done. You, you ask the man, uh, are you going to go to heaven? He well, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm all right. I'm, I'm, I'm real good. I haven't robbed a bank this week or, or done anything bad. You know, I haven't gone and killed anybody or committed adultery or whatever. That's not it, people. We're all lost without Christ. And we're saved in Christ. Our Father, we send this message out for all of those out there in the world for my children that you've given to me to feed and to take care of throughout the world. Father, please forgive me where I fail you. Help us all to follow in your footsteps. In Jesus' precious name we pray.